We have one more presenter, Jonathan Hollander and Imad Salem, who are both in the, they're leaders of the Battery Dance Company, which is working in over 60 countries worldwide. They're going to present some examples of their work in the trenches and an overview of the data they have collected in assessing their programs. <laughs> Does everybody want to stretch for a second? <laughs> First of all, thank you so much, Joni, for uh, calling us all together for this purpose that I, I live by. And I also want to thank Cynthia, Joni, and Peggy Ayers for calling attention to the Battery Dance Company, which, um, though we started in 1976 in Lower Manhattan, has been working pretty much under the radar screen until these ladies uh, raised the banner for us. And I also want to thank our board members who are here, our board chair, Helena Finn, our emeritus chair, Zachary Snow, our vice chair, Judy Killichand, our newest board member, Dorit Heimer. Who am I missing? Anyway, we have um, individuals who really believe in what we're doing. And show me how to, how to do this. I click that. What, what um, I want to talk about a little bit is the power of the individual. I think that that stands for American values, democracy, and what so many artists across the United States are doing. They're not waiting for somebody to deliver um, an opportunity. They're making the opportunities, and that's what my career has been. And I was able to do this. Can we start the video? Um, I was able to do this because I'm surrounded by incredibly talented people, in this case dancers who are teaching artists, choreographers, and cultural diplomats. that was presented in August at our 33rd annual Downtown Dance Festival managed by Gabriella Sopola, who's in the audience as well. The choreography was done by Theo Nadindwa from Cape Town, South Africa. And so Karen was talking about the way that artists work together and across borders and uh, motivate and inspire each other. And uh, that's just one example of the artists of Battery Dance Company who are our secret weapons. Um, I just um, my career started in 19, really in uh, way back when I was a teenager, and the American Field Service, which is the largest high school exchange program in the world, sending 12,000 students from one country to another to live with families which is actually uh, having its 100th anniversary this year. I went to India. I lived in Mumbai with the Siddharth and Nirupa Mehta. Just so happened that Nirupa Mehta was the founder of the Indian National Theater, and that started a relationship with India, which continued up through this year. Um, and our downtown dance festival has given us the opportunity to welcome artists to the United States in a very modest way, but to meet the public downtown in public spaces. This was uh, two years ago, one of the leading Bharatanatyam dancers from India performed at the Downtown Dance Festival. And the Sutra Dance Theater from Malaysia um, followed the year after. You see Art in the Workplace, which is what the Downtown Dance Festival was founded to do, to bring art into the public sphere, which is again something that American value that everyone deserves the arts, everyone deserves access to the arts. This year when we were in India, we, uh, Robin and Sean, two of our wonderful dancers, were able to perform and teach in Srinagar, Kashmir, in a school completely um, conservative values, and the school had never had any dance before. They didn't know whether the students would respond and react. I think, actually, the parents were the big problem that they had to get through. These are students at that school in, in Srinagar. You'll see boys and girls both participating. They came out of their uniforms and uh, are dancing together in a program that we developed in 2006 called Dancing to Connect. And this program is different from the traditional uh, 
teaching methodology of dance. We don't stand in front and imitate and create anything to be imitated. We give students around the world in 40 plus countries the opportunity to create their own dances and to embed in choreography and movement things that are vital and current and important to them. When, when they came back from Srinagar and we saw these pictures, it was just unbelievable to us because Imad and I, in the, in the work up to these programs, we have so many barriers and so many questions, will this work? And it seems to work everywhere, just like hip hop. We moved on to Mumbai and uh, we did workshops with six different charities that work with street children. And as you can see, they jumped right into it. We had the opportunity to collaborate with one of our board members who had started an organization in Mumbai called Emancipaction that joined with the Aspen Institute to create a two-day conference to combat human trafficking. And Laura Entwistle, this board member, was really keen on exploring different ways of uh, working with young people, working with survivors. And so we combined with Catalyst, an NGO that's a home for uh, survivors of human trafficking. And you see Lydia Tetzloff, one of our teaching artists, addressing them the first day and working in the process of the dancing to connect and actually telling the girls, no, we're not going to show you what we do in New York. We're going to use what you can do and build a dance piece. Here you see Tade Brudnik in the background and the girls are actually creating their own movement. There was a performance for 600 people at uh, one of the main auditoriums in New Delhi, and two groups of these students performed. Moving on to the sort of large scale of Battery Dance Company, when I met with Peggy Ayers a few years ago at the Robert Sterling Clark Foundation, Peggy said, I really like what you're doing. These programs are, are pivotal, they're important, but how can you help and propagate this idea of what Battery Dance Company is doing? How can you share it with other dance companies in the United States and other performing arts organizations? So she encouraged us to create something that's now called the Cultural Diplomacy Toolkit. We've embedded lessons learned, strategic information, and photos and videos of our programs in 60 countries around the world, and this is free access, it's on the internet. Joni asked me to talk a little bit about our programs in Africa. We've been working in 15 countries in Africa since 2009. And here you see Robin Cantrell, one of our dancers, interacting with a young man in Tanzania Two years after the fact, they found each other on the street, they had worked together, and you see him on stage in a Dancing to Connect production, which the students, again, created. None of these pieces are prefabricated. The students in any country, in any city that we work in, create their own work, and modeled and, and of course, mentored by our teaching artists, because these kids, many of them have had no formalized dance training before they do this program. This is the audience. You can see that it's an exciting, um, pulse-raising kind of experience for these kids after they've been working for 20 hours in the studio over the course of about five days to actually perform for, in many cases, the leadership of their countries, but also their peers and their families. The pride and the excitement and exhilaration that comes from this experience is palpable. This is one of the groups in Tanzania in a rehearsal of, move, of dance that they had created. So you can see the teamwork, coordination, and all of the elements that go into choreographing a piece are embedded in this program. Watching this, just think about the fact that nothing existed four or five days earlier, and this entire esprit de corps was built over that time. Um, just moving around the continent of Africa to show you images of the different places we've been. I mean, Guinea is on everybody's mind right now because of the Ebola virus. 
Robin, who worked with um, young people there, came back and said it was the poorest country she'd ever been to, and it was also her favorite program. And there she is with Sean Scantleberry and one of the leading dancers of Guinea. One of the secret weapons we have is Barry Steele, our lighting designer, tech director, will do anything, anywhere for any number of hours. I remember his scaling bamboo scaffolding in a theater in Madras all night long, no air conditioning to, to get ready for a show. And he trains local technicians in lighting um, and, and other kind of technological theater tricks. And it's, it's one of our most popular workshops. When we went to the DRC, Kinshasa, um, just I remember the first day there that we were given this intensive security briefing, which was really necessary because there were gunshots go going off daily near our hotel. Um, the, the most interesting and compelling moment for me was when we met the participants of the Dancing to Connect. There were 60 young people. And they had expressions like those two men on the, on the left and in the middle. They, we had just come from Kenya, Nairobi, where there was this warmth and immediate adoption of us. In, in Congo, it was very, very different. It was actually frightening, and I didn't know how we were going to get through the barrier. And after the first day, there were some serious problems where the participants wanted to be paid for being in the workshops. Um, we had a very strong person at the U.S. Embassy there who was Congolese, and she you know, told them how it was going to be. This is three days later. They're on the stage of the Al de la Gombe, a French, a part of the French um, enclave there. And one of the things that was very compelling here is that the audience was mixed, Congolese and French and expats. And we had been told beforehand that there were programs every single night at this Al de, de la Gombe because there's very little place to perform there. We'd been told that Generally speaking, the performances would either be native Congolese or expats, and our audience was mixed. These are the young dancers. They were, they were fabulous. I remember thinking if they were at the Live Arts New York, they would be ready, get a great review. And this is the reaction um, that they had with our teaching artist, Oliver Tobin. These are just quick images to show the kind of feeling that we had there, that we were, we were in, we had made it, we were accepted. And that is the audience. I'm going to talk a little bit about Algeria. I'm, I'm going to just flip through these slides because I'm getting the cue from Joni. Um, this, we had a three-year program in Algeria that involved our going to Algeria, Algerians coming and being part of our production in New York. This is in Anaba. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Anaba, Algeria. It's really not in the mainstream. Uh, very few people spoke English. They had the sign up on the theater for the day, on the day of our performance, that was the only publicity, and the place was packed. <laughs> and this, these are our artists meeting um, the local people who showed up in El Ulma, which is even smaller than Anaba. These are Algerian dancers who came to New York. The US Embassy sent them afterwards to work with our dancers in the studio, create a new production together. And you can see that they just blended right in. And there they are on stage at 3LD Art and Technology in a new production. And finally, the last step of this relationship was we were invited to send our dancers back to Algeria to judge, teach, and perform at an international contemporary dance festival. How could, in three years, they go from not having any contemporary dance to having an international festival? And that's the, uh, the end of the slide presentation. And now I'm going to introduce Imad Salem, the Vice President and Director of Operations of Battery Dance, to talk about our very rigorous evaluation process. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, does everyone know the curse of going last, what it is? <laughs> that I'm the only one standing between you and the cocktail reception. So I'll try to be brief. Uh, so what does this all mean? Very colorful stories from all of the panelists. Um, we have a rigorous evaluation system. Um, 
outcome-based evaluation system that I'm going to share with you some of the results. We evaluate our Dancing to Connect program, which is a one-week program on the ground with 30 to 100 participants from various backgrounds. Uh, the cute picture that's up right now is Roma and non-Roma participants, and it was just taken three weeks ago in a program we did there. So how do we evaluate? Well, we do it through two ways. We do it through questionnaires. Questionnaires measuring different indicators, such as uh, different youth development indicators, education development indicators, conflict resolution indicators. I'll be going through a, a few of them shortly. Uh, and we provide questionnaires to participants before the program and after the program, measuring their responses to these indicators. We then take the results. Anybody a statistician in the house? No? Uh, well, what we do is we, we create cross tabs to find the percentages and the differences. And then we do something called a paired t-test hypothesis test. Sounds really complicated. But that basically tells us that uh, are our results valid with 95% confidence? Is there a real statistically significant change? We also conduct uh, in-depth interviews with our participants and with partners as a way of further verifying the data that we collect and also to capture the kind of uh, intrinsic feeling that the arts create within participants that numbers and questions can't um, easily capture on a questionnaire. So one example is perceptions towards Americans. Just a quick sampling of countries on four continents. Uh, before the program, Guinea had less than, I don't have my glasses on, but it looks like less than 40% very positive perceptions of Americans. We asked them uh, to rate how they view Americans, either very positively, positively, neutral, negatively, very negative. And these are the responses that we get before and after the program, and it's with statistical significance. Uh, that's almost a threefold incre increase in the country of Guinea. What does that translate to? It translates to an increased desire to work with Americans. Uh, again, Guinea and France as well, uh, they want to work with Americans, which is great, uh, after the program. Let's see here. Oh. There we are. Not only does working with an American teaching artist improve perceptions with Americans, uh, of Americans and the desire to work with Americans, but it also increases English language skills. Here in Thailand, you'll see this is a scatter plot. Uh, you'll see the purple circles are before participants' perceptions of their English language skills before. Afterwards, you've got the yellow triangles, how they view their competency in English. And what we do is we ask them on a scale of 0 to 10, with 0 being no competency whatsoever and 10 being fluent, how would they would rank their English language skills. This uh, change is even more pronounced in areas that are more underserved, poor, and have uh, less access to Americans and American culture. Here you'll see in Guinea, before uh, most participants thought that they had no uh, skill in the English language, afterwards they thought they had an intermediate understanding. Now this is their perceptions of their skills. We're not giving them English language tests. We don't have time for that, unfortunately, just one week on the ground. But uh, in 2008, the University of Freiburg in Germany did a study of uh, the program's impact on German students understanding of the English language and found that it did have significant changes in their competency of the English language. And that result propelled uh, our programming in another 20 German cities. So now talking about conflict resolution, working with participants of a different background, we ask participants, usually with the Dancing to Connect program, we'll bring participants from conflicting societies together. In Belfast, between Protestants and Catholics, in Malaysia, there was earlier reference by Dr. Sherbo about uh, refugees. We brought Burmese refugees together with other Malaysians and other ethnic groups. And we asked them before and after the program, uh, how do you feel about working with people from different backgrounds? Uh, on a, you know, very, I highly enjoy it being the top, you know, the best response. Uh, and what we find is statistically significant differences in countries as well. <laughs> Que é dançar, ver o trabalho que foi 
composto por tanto sacrifício que foi nosso, no caso de Carmen, é muito gratificante ter ela do nosso lado. É, é instruindo, ensinando não só técnicas de dança, mas como se tornar um ser humano capaz de fazer as coisas. Eu acho que isso foi o maior truque que ela pode dar para a gente. So This is a program participant from Brazil, and that's just a further indication of, you see from this video, not only uh, increased ability and enjoyment working with people from a different background, but her love for the American teaching artist who guided her in the process, and also the emotions that are coming out. You see that it really did create an impact with her. So the big question that I always get is, well, what about the long-term impact? Well, that's a great question. And we're trying and in the process of trying to evaluate that through online surveys, but it's difficult because of language barriers, access barriers. Some of the participants we're working with don't have access to the internet. Uh, poor online survey response rate of only 25 to 30%. And also our own lack, uh, lack of human and financial uh, capacity to do that. Battery Dance Company does not receive any funding specifically for the purpose of evaluation. We do it so we can understand our participants better for the purpose of furthering the cultural diplomacy field and also um, to improve the program. So just very quickly, because I know I'm about to, but this is the big thing that I think everyone has been talking about and addressing is the funding situation. To give a brief overview of the funding situation, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which is Uh, the agency in charge of all U.S. international broadcasting overseas. Their budget for FY15 is $721 million. million. The budget for the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs, which is the main agency responsible for educational and cultural programming, uh, receives $578 million, but that includes the Fulbright program. Of that, the amount for arts diplomacy, it's unclear for FY15, 90 million for professional and cultural exchanges, but that includes science and business exchanges and sports exchanges as well. Just a couple hours ago, we got off the, f you know, we found out that the total budget for cultural programming for the Bureau of Educational and Cultural Affairs is actually less than 4% of their budget. That 90 million, in addition, is a 10% reduction from last fiscal year. Uh, looking at the evaluation, in addition to the BBG budget, their overall budget, they also give out $10 million a year for the evaluation of the international uh, their international broadcasters. ECA gets a paltry $1.2 million, which is taken out of their overall budget for the evaluation of all their programs, including Fulbright, and there is no comprehensive budget for the evaluation of arts diplomacy programming. Um, the last Art uh, diplomacy programming conducted by ECA was a 2006 Jazz Ambassadors program, uh, and they didn't uh, ask participants questions. They actually only asked the musicians and embassy staff questions. So, wrapping up, I'll actually hand it over to Jonathan, who's going to make final remarks. But looking at the Iraq pilot program, we also see similar results: reduced support for war and conflict, improved perceptions of Americans, and uh, increased. Uh, ability to work with people from a different background in a program where we brought together Sunnis, Shias, Christians, Arabs, and Kurds. So I'll just hand it back to Jonathan. Thank you. You can see it my video. Joni is going to kill me, but I have to show you something that came through this Saturday at three o'clock in the afternoon. And the reason that this is relevant, in addition to the very personal um, issue you're going to see, is that um, people have been talking about social media, the importance of live action, people to people, but also the importance of doing things. Karen was talking about um, the video conferencing. One of the new initiatives of Battery Dance Company is to follow up with some of our participants who are in need of instruction to find teachers for uh, students in Erbil and Baghdad where all of a sudden there's no money to pay professors, there's no money, money to pay violin teachers or piano teachers. So setting up Skype lessons with Juilliard graduates who are teachers um, in the United States and using social media. This is something that came through to me on Saturday from a dancer in Baghdad who I have been mentoring um, over the past three weeks only. This is 
is a video he created when I asked him to send me an example of his dancing so that I could begin to critique it and use our dancers to help mentor him. Dangerous for him to dance in Baghdad. 